Chapters twenty two to twenty three of Tristram Shandy, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman, Volume One, by Lawrence Stern, Chapter twenty two. The learned Bishop Hall, I mean the famous Dr. Joseph Hall, who was Bishop of Exeter in King James I's reign, tells us in one of Decad's, at the end of his Divine Art of Meditation, imprinted at London in the year 1610 by John Beale, dwelling in Aldersgate Street, that it is an abominable thing for a man to commend himself. And I really think it is so. And yet, on the other hand, when a thing is executed in a masterly kind of a fashion, which thing is not likely to be found out, I think it is full as abominable that a man should lose the honour of it and go out of the world with the conceit of it rotting in his head. This is precisely my situation. For in this long digression, which I was accidentally led into, as in all my digressions, one only excepted, there is a master stroke of digressive skill, the merit of which has all along, I fear, been overlooked by my reader, not for want of penetration in him, but because tis an excellence seldom looked for or expected indeed in a digression. And it is this, that though my digressions are all fear, as you observe, and that I fly off from what I am about as far and as often too as any writer in Great Britain. Yet I constantly take care to order affairs so that my main business does not stand still in my absence. I was just going, for example, to have given you the great outlines of my Uncle Toby's most whimsical character, when my Aunt Dinah and the coachman came across us, and led us a vagary some millions of miles into the very heart of the planetary system. Notwithstanding all this, you perceive that the drawing of my Uncle Toby's character went on gently all the time, not the great contours of it, that was impossible, but some familiar strokes and faint designations of it were here and there touched on as we went along so that you are much better acquainted with my uncle toby now than you were before by this contrivance the machinery of my work is of a species by itself two contrary motions are introduced into it and reconciled which were thought to be at variance with each other in a word my work is degressive and it is progressive too and at the same time this sir is a very different story from that of the earth's moving round her axis, in her diurnal motion, with her progress in her elliptic orbit, which brings about the year, and constitutes that variety and vicissitude of seasons we enjoy. Though I own it suggested the thought, as I believe the greatest of our boasted improvements and discoveries have come from such trifling hints, digressions incontestably are the sunshine they're the life the soul of reading take them out of this book for instance you might as well take the book along with them one cold eternal winter would reign in every page of it restore them to the writer he sets forth like a bridegroom bids all hail brings in variety and forbids the appetite to fail all the dexterity is in the good cookery and management of them so as to be not only for the advantage of the reader but also of the author whose distress in this matter is truly pitiable for if he begins a digression from that moment i observe his whole work stands stock still and he goes on with his main work then there is an end of his digression this is vile work for which reason from the beginning of this you see i have constructed the main work and the adventitious parts of it with such intersections and have so complicated and involved the digressions and progressive movements one wheel within another that the whole machine 
in general, has been kept a going, and what's more, it shall be kept a going these forty years, if it please the fountains of health to bless me so long with life and good spirits. Chapter twenty three. I have a strong propensity in me to begin this chapter very nonsensically, and I will not bulk my fancy. Accordingly, I set off thus. If the fixture of Momus's glass and the human breast, according to the proposed emendation of that arch critic, had taken place, first this foolish consequence would certainly have followed that the very wisest and very gravest of us all, in one coin or other, must have paid window money every day of our lives. And secondly, that had the said glass been there set up, nothing more would have been wanting in order to have taken a man's character, but to have taken a chair and gone softly, as you would to a dioptrical beehive, and looked in, viewed the soul stark naked, observed all her motions, her machinations, traced all her maggots from their first engendering to their crawling forth, watched her loosen her frisks, her gambles, her capricios, and after some notice of her more solemn deportment, consequent upon such frisks, etc., then take in your pen and ink and set down nothing but what you had seen, and could have sworn to. But this is an advantage not to be had by the biographer in this planet. In the planet Mercury be like, it may be so, if not better still for him, for there the intense heat of the country, which is proved by computators, from its vicinity to the sun, to be more than equal to that of red-hot iron, must, I think, long ago have vitrified the bodies of the inhabitants, as the efficient cause, to suit them to the climate, which is the final cause, so that betwixt them both, all the tenements of their soul, from top to bottom, may be nothing else, for aught the soundest philosophy can show to the contrary, but one fine transparent body of clear glass, baiting the umbilical knot, so that till the inhabitants grow old and tolerably wrinkled, whereby the rays of light in passing through them become so monstrously refracted or return reflected from their surfaces in such traverse lines to the eye that a man cannot be seen through, his soul might as well unless for mere ceremony, or the trifling advantage which the umbilical point gave her, might, upon all other accounts, I say, as well play the fool out of doors as in her own house. But this, as I said above, is not the case of the inhabitants of this earth. Our minds shine not through the body, but are wrapped up here in a dark covering of uncrystallized flesh and blood, so that if we would come to the specific characters of them, we must go some other way to work. Many in good truth are the ways which human wit has been forced to take to do this thing with exactness. Some, for instance, draw all their characters with wind instruments. Virgil takes notice of that way in the affair of Dido and Aeneas, but it is as fallacious as the breath of fame and moreover bespeaks a narrow genius. I am not ignorant that the Italians pretend to a mathematical exactness in their designations of one particular sort of character among them, from the forte or piano of a certain wind instrument they use, which they say is infallible. I dare not mention the name of the instrument in this place. Tis sufficient we have it amongst us, but never think of making a drawing by it, this is enigmatical, and intended to be so, at least ad populum, and therefore I beg, madame, when you come here, that you read on as fast as you can, and never stop to make any inquiry about it. There are others again who will draw a man's character from no other helps in the world, but merely from his evacuations. But this often gives a very incorrect outline, unless, indeed, you take a sketch of his repletions too, and by correcting one drawing from the other, compound one good figure out of them both. I should have no objection to this method, but that I think it must smell too strong of the lamp, 
and be rendered still more operose by forcing you to have an eye to the rest of his non-naturals why the most natural actions of a man's life should be called his non-naturals is another question there are others fourthly who disdain every one of these expedients not from any fertility of their own but from the various ways of doing it which they have borrowed from the honourable devices which the pentagraphic brethren of the brush have shown in taking copies these you must know are your great historians one of these you will see drawing a full-length character against the light that's a liberal dishonest and hard upon the character of the man who sits others to mend matters will make a drawing of you in the camera that is most unfair of all because there you are sure to be represented in some of your most ridiculous attitudes to avoid all and every one of these errors in giving you my uncle toby's character i am determined to draw it by no mechanical help whatever nor shall my pencil be guided by any one wind instrument whichever was blown upon either on this or the other side of the alps nor will i consider either his repletions or his discharges or touch upon his non-naturals but in a word i will draw my uncle toby's character from his hobby horse end of chapter twenty three